Hey, this is Matt once again. What about to another video? This is another paid request. This time for Andrew. Thank you so much for that. Now, for those anyone interested in requesting pretty much any type of commentary or review, topic, randomness, out of the blueness, reaction, re-review, pretty much anything, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box under the video. And Andrew wanted me to do a commentary for The Breakfast Club this little film here. Now, I have it synced up. I'm actually, I have the Blu-ray, I just don't remember where I put the disc, because I put in one of these, like, CD folders, I can't remember which one, but I'm just watching it on the computer, a version of it, and I have it paused, so the sync up, countdown, three, two, one, Pressing play. And we got the Universal, and we're going, there you go, it's the music. Don't You Forget About Me by the band Simple Minds, which I don't know any other songs that band did, but great song. It's one of those songs you hear immediately think of the 80s. Now, of course, a John Hughes film for Sinking The Breakfast Club and fade out Emilio Estevez gets first billing to his alphabetical order Paul Gleason sadly he's passed away but he was in Die Hard among many others Anthony Michael Hall worked with John Hughes on 16 Candles before and Weird Science After John Capellos he plays the janitor he was supposed uh, Rick Moranis was going to play him but then he had creative differences I guess with John Hughes Molly Reedwell was in 16 Candles Ali Sheedy after the she did short circuit a great cast and this cast did do a wonderful job on the film and uh, that's what makes the film is John Hughes had a nice job in the writing department and there was also some ad-libbing that was fitting for the movie you had a great song that opens up that gets people in the mood and it's it's one of those movies that it's strange that it works because it's such a simple concept. It's really one of the most simple concepts you could have for a film. You have a group of five kids, different types. Uh, rest in peace, David Bowie. We got a quote from David Bowie. And these children, children that spit on you as they try to change their worlds are immune to your cons consultations. They're quite aware of what they're going through. It's an interesting idea that at the beginning you have one voice narrating this note. Anthony Michael Hall. Then at the end they do the same thing but this time it's all five united reading the note. So kind of in a weird way shows the bond these five have gone through. Again the at the beginning they were singular but by the end they kind of almost form their own club. And it's interesting these pictures showcasing bits of the school. And like telling the story of the school without any dot, yeah. You know, the empty remains. Even though, you know, Bender's locker opened his locker and you're dead. <laughs> Little Hayman's noose there. And you die. That word would never be F-A-G. That would never be put into a movie today. Be too on PC. And even in the terms of these... Co these uh, Is that Derek Graham as the father? Maybe a different guy. Maybe not. The Derek Graham I'm thinking of is from Bud from Bud the Chud Chud to you. No, it might be a different guy. But it's interesting, even the different cars, the different ways they get dropped off of school. For I understand, this is actually Anthony Michael Hall's mom and Anthony Michael Hall's sister who plays the mom and sister. 
Now, of course, the sister has to be brow nose or suck up. But like, each one has different cars, different lifestyles, different. This guy, I know I've seen in other movies who plays Emilio, Emilio's dad. I can't remember what movie, though, but I know I've seen him in stuff. But even you even get the first inkling that, you know, later on when they talk about the deal they had with their parents, they showcases, like, this little exchange with the parents, Judd Nelson coming to school by himself, not being dropped off, hear the parent not even talking or saying bye to their kid shows that the youth could be very well affected by the parrot, the upbringing, the history, all sorts of things in between. Which sadly I think is a lot of the case. You know, a lot of times people want to blame the media, movies, TV shows. You know, someone said movies don't create cycles, movies make cycles more creative. If you don't have parenting worth a shit and they're fucked up on either end of the spectrum that can really warp a child's mind. And I know a lot of people look at this film nowadays and say it's old-fashioned and blah blah blah, but I disagree. I think maybe the clothes have changed, and this is a big fucking library, I'll say that. This is a gigantic fucking library. It's about as big as another school. <laughs> but... Or maybe because my school never had a library that big. There's Paul Gleason. He was the cop, out, one of the cops outside of Die Hard, outside of the building, who was way over his head. And even Sergeant Al Powell, Reginald Vell Johnson's like, get a load of this fucking guy. But he was in that film, Die Hard. He was in a film called Abominable. He's been in a few other stuff as well, Paul Gleason. And again, the how do you make a film where for 90 minutes it's just five kids pretty much in one location? It's, I mean, they go a little bit into other parts of the school, like Judd Nelson, the basketball court. But it's one of those things where how do you make this exciting or thrilling or funny when you're set in one look? It's such a challenge from the get-go. Because you, visuals, you don't have a lot to rely on. You have to rely on the actors and the dialogue. And Judd Nelson is a very fun... Still think this is like best performance. And what I, from what I understand, I think Nick Cage was thought of for the part, and then it was going to be John Tuzat, but then John Hughes changed his mind and said, well, John Tuzat didn't look dangerous enough, so he got Judd Nelson. And I've heard that John Hughes did not like working with Judd Nelson. Barry Manilow, no, you raid his wardrobe. <laughs> I'm sure nowadays people are like, who the hell is Barry Manilow? <laughs> That's the bully get the horn. <laughs> but again, like you look at these actors and they just clit. I mean it was lightning in a bottle. And they each have their unique personalities. They said you have the princess, you have the jock, you have the weirdo, the brain, and the the bully slash criminal and how they interact with each other and yet the show <laughs> I don't know why that makes me laugh where Judd Nelson just goes I've seen you before you know I don't know why it's just such a weird statement like you guys are in the same school I hope you've seen each other before but I didn't. I come from a school that was very small.
Anthony Michael Hall, I mean, this is, I did before this, he had been 16 candles, and he was kind of the John Hughes staple for a while. Like I said, he, John Hughes, I think, had a part writing National Lampoon's Vacation. I mean, Harold Ramis directed it. And Anthony Michael Hall was in that. Sixteen Candles, this one, Weird Science. And I think after Weird Science... I've heard that... I don't know if it's true. Again, this is all going to be false. That John Hughes wanted Anthony Michael Hall to play Ferris Bueller. And he's like, nah, you know, I kind of want to go away from those roles and... Like, John Hughes was, like, upset about that. Same with Molly Ringwald. He wanted Molly Ringwald for other films, and she's like, I gotta grow out of this, and he was upset with that. Weirdly enough, I think the first time I saw this, I saw, like, an edited version. I don't know if it was... I think my aunt had sent a tape of this. And like, it was like an edited version. Pretty much all the dial, the cussing was cut out. And like, do you think I give a sh And it cuts away. It might be like a TV version. Maybe that's what it was. Totally. <laughs> yeah. I think at one point with Emilio Estevez, they wanted him for the Judd Nelson role, but John Hughes said, well, we don't have anything for this jock. <clears throat> so pretty much like from the beginning, we got them getting on each other's nerves, trying to get situated in this situation. And then... It all leads up to sort of the actually being able to talk to each other about sort of their innermost demons. <coughs> Richard Vernon, Paul Gleason's name. But, like, Molly Ringwald, she pretty much just, I just didn't want to be this sort of teen girl. She didn't do a whole lot when, she, I mean, she was in stuff, like, she was in The Stand, the TV miniseries. She was in this film, The Pickup Artist, with Robert Downey Jr., but, <clears throat> was it this one horror movie called Cut? Judd Nelson... He would appear in some films, but it seemed like he never got to the success of a role like this. Now, I know there have been reunions, and I don't know why Emilio Estevez never goes to them. He never talks about like his old movies. And it's weird, like, he went back for that Mighty Ducks TV show, but then didn't come, didn't come back for season two. Which, hell, there should not have been season one anyway. Fuck Disney Plus, but... I don't know, it just seems weird and... But, yeah, like... I don't know. And I like Emilio, Emilio Estevez. I like a lot of his movies. I mean, this was 85. A year later, he was in Maximum Overdrive, which is a personal favorite of mine. And Young Guns, I enjoy. Judgment Night, I enjoy... And all that jazz. So I always like to be men at work I enjoy. So it's sad, but social. <laughs> I 
I mean, I had never heard that there was a physics class. I uh, just like Ali. She's like, she's just, you run out of steam, man. You're just going downhill. Miss it, miss it a whole, actually, meat. <laughs> I did. You would never see, hear some of this dialogue. Be too on PC. For guys who's. <laughs> I mean, Jed Nelson's character is really the instigator, just trying to light up. I wear to... <laughs> so you mean tights? Shut up. <laughs> I mean, it, it's the timing that works as well. And you get these actors that really were in sync. And again, apparently Judd Nelson was in character so what kind of bully Molly Ringwald and at one point was going to get fired from John Hughes for that but people like Paul Gleason's like hey he's a good actor he's just trying to be in the character I mean Judd Nelson I do like he was in films like New Jack City which I enjoyed but I'm just saying you know, he's been in films but there's never character you play that got into the limelight as this one. Uh, this is getting to one of the big fun exchanges where he keeps getting all the detentions. And I don't know if a film like this would ever get into a theater of today. I think if this film was made, it would just be dumped on VOD or streaming. Because, well, if it's this type of film, then it has to be, like, big special effects or dream sequences they would put in. Where they would fantasize that they would... And apparently one of the things that was written was that throughout the film they would fantasize like all random stuff and Godzilla like all this stuff and that was written in the script and they didn't do it but yeah Paul Gleason's character definitely comes off as a major prick just a I always thought that this principal was such a piece of shit person. Just such a terrible person. Okay, no, we're not there yet with the conversation. It's... His brilliant idea with his chair is gonna... <laughs> to... I think in a way that... It's one of those films that you just see yourself... Something not exactly happening like this, but in a weird way relatable. And I did it's a it's something anyone could understand this whole a day you know You take detention, you spend a day and what could come up if you actually tried to talk to each other and maybe even by then spill your soul. I think it's very risky. I mean, I think, yeah, you do this film that doesn't have a lot of outside material. You're not really going any places. The only visual aspect is mostly this one library. This one detention place, and it's rated R. Nowadays, it would be they want to cut it down to PG-13. Before Bart Simpson said it, he said, "Eat my shorts."
Who we'll keep going? <laughs> no. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But even then, like, even though there was some animosity, like, Molly Ringwald is like, hey, stop. Like, there's a, a semblance of care. <laughs> no, sir, it's seven. It's eight. <laughs> I didn't such a pr principle. This is a principle that someone just has to catch on a cell phone, and he would be fired. He would get fucking fired. Because of his behavior. And that's the thing with these kids is they're not one dimensional. Like you just make this Judd Nelson theater one dimensional criminal that by the end wants to, I don't know, fucking kill someone or something and... It shows even by this, he's still out of it and upset by what transpired. And John Hughes after this, I mean, he did have a successful series of movies. Like I said, he had Weird Science, which I love. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, which may be my favorite John Hughes film. It's between that and Weird Science. Although I do enjoy this film quite a bit. What was it? Uh, Uncle Buck I enjoyed. Curly Sue isn't much. And it's sad that I was... I, I just... These little things like what to do when you're bored. Like playing with the the thing on your sweater. I've done that before. I will admit, this thing with the finger, I've done that before, tying around and see what happens. Um, I've never gone detention, but there'll be times where you're bored and you just try to find what the hell's to do. <laughs> Paper football. Yeah, this thing with the, the dandruff. I think I remember reading that's actually a Parmesan cheese, like from a shaker. It's not actually dandruff, folks. The score in the film is alright. The other songs, like if you listen to the soundtrack, the only song worth a shit is the Simple Minds, Don't You Forget About Me. The other song, I mean, maybe the song when they're getting high is, is okay. But when people hear the soundtrack, they hear that one song. <clears throat> Who has to use the lavatory? <laughs> like, what do you do to pass the time? I did mean, nowadays, there'd be like a ton of security cameras. There'd probably be a teacher standing by. Maybe they saw this film. They said, well, yeah, let's have a teacher stand by in case someone decides to just rip books just randomly. I think Anthony McCall is interesting. Because, like I said, he wanted to get out of this sort of teen mode and would go on to... He tried to do this film out of bounds, which was like a thriller, and that didn't work out. And then there was toss of him being Full Metal Jacket, the, the Matthew Modine role. That was going to be Anthony Michael Hall. And depending on who you ask, some say it was a salary issue, some say it was something else, but... I do think if Anthony Michael Hall starred in Full Metal Jacket, it definitely would have changed his career a bit. Just no matter what, you're in a Stanley Tubert film. 
I mean, I know Matthew Modine didn't go on to do a whole lot, but Anthony Michael Hall honestly was a bigger name than Matthew Modine at the time because people was like, wait, that guy from the weird science guy? Like, it, it would have given people more thought, more pause. <clears throat> and then you get into the 90s, it was just a lot of... Uh, he was in Edward Scissorhands, which was good. On the flip side, he was in films like Hail Caesar, which is awful. And then, like, I think Michael Hall, you would he see pop up once in a while. He did, I think, Johnny Be Good. Film no one remembers. <coughs> he was a football guy. It wasn't until The Dead Zone. And I like The Dead Zone TV show. I do quite enjoy that. It's just, I didn't like the last season where... It wasn't much of an ending. I thought it was a really lame ending. He didn't die or anything, but I thought, well, this isn't really a culmination of events. I want an actual ending. So, I, I don't care for... I, it's a good, I think it's a good show. I think, it's a, I think Michael Hall did a wonderful job. As a person, I've heard a lot of bad things about him. I've heard a lot of things that he's a dickhead and he's an asshole and... A lot of horrible stuff. I love this. You hear this? You want me to turn it up? <laughs> and yeah, I don't know if that's written or that's ad lib. Like, do you hear this? You want to turn it up? <clears throat> but yeah, I I've liked Anthony Beckham quite a few roles, and of course he was in Halloween Kills that came out recently. Neil Maxi Zoom Dweeby. <clears throat> I know it sounds stupid, but even the outfits, I thought they picked the right outfits. Like, none of them looked similar to each other. You know, the rebel with the blue jean jacket type and the flannel underneath. You have the sweater from Emilio's character. <coughs> of course, Ali Sheedy's dressed in black. And that cover, definitely uh, something people remember. I mean, he was even parodied for Texas Chainsaw Master 2. Now, this is uh, the 25th anniversary Blu-ray, and it's got a documentary. It was nice to hear from people like Judd Nelson, Anthony Michael Hall, uh, Noah Emilio Estevez. You hear from Amy Heckerling. I didn't care about hearing about Diablo Cody. Commentary with Judd Nelson, Anthony Michael Hall. I know there's a Criterion that I don't have, and apparently the Criterion has like 50 minutes of deleted scenes, because the original idea for this film, for from John Hughes, was that it was going to be like a two and a half hour movie. Now, I like the film, but I don't see how the hell you could make this a two and a half hour movie. Now, I would not be surprised if there's another cut of this film out there that someone made to put those deleted scenes back in. Maybe I would give it a watch, out of curiosity, but I know on the Criterion, there's not a cut, it's just there's 50 scenes of, 50 minutes of deleted scenes. And, I mean, again, it'd be interesting, interesting, if I wanted to talk to see an extended cut. Again, I'm sure there's someone that put that together, but, at the same time, this is about an hour and a half, give or take, hour and 35. That's the right length for this kind of film, because at, at the, it's still people just in one place for detention. Like, two and a half... Funny enough, nowadays, it probably would go for the two and a half hours, since every movie has to be fucking an epic, epic length. 
And there's a lot of things that I hear in this that I did, I hear reference later on. Like two things, I hit you, two hits, me hitting you and you hitting the floor. Well, I don't know if that's ever been said before that, but, you know, that's the thing I've heard many times after. I didn't hear this, you want to turn it up, eat my shorts. I didn't, maybe there was stuff before that mentioned that, but it's something I heard a lot afterward get referenced in other movies and shows and media. I always like this bit here where Ali Sheedy just steals the knife and then never comes back into play. I mean, she takes the knife and then I don't think we ever see that knife again. And he's never like, where the hell did this knife go? <laughs> where happened to this knife? Here's the janitor, John Capello's. Again, I did, originally it was supposed to be Rip Moranis, but I guess he had some disagreements with John Hughes. What those creative disagreements were, I don't know. I don't know if he wanted to do an accent, or he was trying to do maybe a skit from his SCTV days. I don't know. I've also heard there was supposed to be like a female gym teacher, and then she got deleted. I don't know if they deleted her, they didn't film any scenes with her, or they, she got cast, but they deleted her from the script. I don't know. Another story I've heard is that this guy who plays a janitor made a joke like, Hey kids, like don't be too intense, don't be, you know, take this too seriously. Like, I remember one time, you know, hearing that Martin Sheen had a heart attack in Apocalypse Now. And he didn't know that Emilio Estevez was the son of Martin Sheen. Probably just, you know, last name. Estevez and Sheen. Very different names. And, of course, Emilio Estevez got pissed at him. And he was like, oh, well, I'm sorry. And apparently, sometime later, this guy talked with Martin Sheen on the TV show of the West Wing. He told the story. Martin Sheen laughed and said, <laughs> that's pretty funny. So, obviously, Martin Sheen had no issues with it. Now, of course, this whistle is from the song from Bridge on the River Kwai. Because I always remember from Spaceballs what the little wannabe jaw was doing this. But it's from Bridge on the River Kwai. And, of course, with just... The impending sense of doom. <laughs> I mean, this principal is just such a dickhead that he would be. I, I, I he would be fired. I mean, just put a cell phone and. Put it on YouTube, and he, he would get canceled real quick, this principal. But again, it is that lightning of a bottle where you get the right cast and the right pieces of dialogue. Again, two and a half hours, nah, the 90 minutes, okay. I swear, I thought there was... Didn't they remake this film? Or there was talk of remaking this film? I swear there was talk of remaking this film. And if they did, I don't remember it. I mean, they've remade films. I'm like, really? There's a remake? Like, Adventures in Babysitting. I'm like, there's a remake of that? Grab something here. All right. I always forget that, you know, by the end, you find out, at least this is what she says, that Ali Sheedy, she didn't really have to be at detention, she just had nothing better to do, and she went here. <clears throat> I 
I did. I know there's people that will comment about this film that is dated, that you know, kids of today deal with different issues. And yeah, I understand that. That's true. But at the same time, I still think it's relevant where it's about kids that are lost because their parents don't understand, don't try to understand, don't try to relate to it, kind of leave them in the Wild West to fend for themselves, and that their behavior distills down to the children's behavior, and you're made to fill these roles that whether it be popularity for Molly or an abusive home for Judd or just pressure. You gotta be super smart and get A's. You gotta be the best and maybe, hey, I joke around like I joked around in school and all sorts of stuff. She lives in Canada. I think that's referenced in like Weird Science as well. That I think Michael Hall's character has a... He has a girlfriend from Canada or something. I believe that's referenced in Weird Science. And 19, I mean, like a lot of years in the 80s, 1985 was a good year. I mean, 1985, you had, like, action. You had Rambo for Split Part 2, Rocky 4, Commando, just to say a couple. about personal business. Well, it doesn't sound like doing any business. <laughs> See, this is a film that showcases how important the cast... You know, someone has said that if you cast right, most of your work is done. And on top of that, you get the right amount of ad-libbing, but the right amount of dialogue and all that. And again, a sense of timing, which again, the fact that there's 50 minutes of deleted scenes... It shows that some credit goes to the editing and to the the pacing of the film. And even this whole thing with each one has their unique food. Sushi here. Which I read that apparently at first it will be pasta. And someone mentioned, well, you know, sushi seemed like more of a high class girl would eat. And, of course, the wrestler... The jock has like a ton of food. Which I don't know if a jock would have that much food. I mean I know there's a... Maybe a bodybuilder but... Like this you got... Coca-Cola can. You got... Three sandwiches. Potato chips. Donuts. And milk. And a banana. And an apple. The thing that makes me laugh is when he has the sandwich. When it falls off, he just says, the hell are you staring at? For some reason that cracks me up. I don't know why, just that kind of timing of, like it falls. <laughs> what the hell is your problem? I don't know why that makes me laugh. It just, kind of that, that silence and subtle. And then it falls. The hell is your problem? I, I guess just so sincere about that. And then, how does the cootie lady do it? Pixie Sticks and Captain Crunch. Now that's a sugar high. That is a sugar high. By the way, would a wrestler eat donuts and potato chips as part of their lunch? I, I mean, if anyone who's like a big wrestler watches this, you let me know, is potato chips and donuts part of a... Wouldn't that be like, no, no junk, no fat? 
I'm just wondering if anyone who's a wrestler out there, let me know. Coca-Cola. That's the old school, like lo the logo with the the font of Coke. I wonder if that was like the new, new Coke or something. Chocolate chip cookies, that's what it is. Real chocolate chip. I thought it was donuts, but it's chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> and here's, you know, once again, John Nelson being a prick. I make it seem as if it's Wally Beaver, Leave it to Beaver, sitcom, perfect. And you get this look on Anthony Michael Hall going, it's nothing like that at all. And maybe he wants to take like an anger offensive to that, but it's like, maybe in his mind, like I wish my family was like that. I wish my life was like that, but it's not in the slightest. Because we all idea and sort of this like you have no idea what it is. I think some of the deleted material again, I don't know if it's filmed or written, but I read up like this scene was extended. Yeah, so John Nelson mentions how abusive it is and cigarette burns and all that jazz. And you get the idea that you have this kind of behavior. It will warp someone and turn into someone this volatile. Which is true. When you have, I mean, there's many cases where people go through that circumstance. And there are exceptions, of course. There are exceptions where you know, kids have the a great home life, but then... Either they're mentally fucked up, or they're just... Some other issues come about, or... Some are just plain... Maybe evil, I don't know. And this is where sort of Judd Nelson's character... Braces facade, like, you don't believe me? Really? Like, this is where he gets super serious now. The fact that anyone could even remotely think that he was making this up. It's interesting that the this whole bit here had a, that this little bit like a musical sting. Because it's very sparing usage of music and... And as Emilio says, you know, how was I supposed to know? He makes up other stuff. <clears throat> and the thing is, like, the, 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 yeah, I'm sure there's a remake that could be ma made in today, but the thing about it is that if you did a remake today, it would just be filled with so much socio political commentary and, of all sorts of different stuff and sexism, racism. This is about the fruit of the fruit of the loom. It's just about this primary stasis that they all are joined together is Well, I mean, you know, maybe it could. Maybe you take a group of people and one's very <coughs> But it's like, you know, what, the one's going to be very pro-Trump, and one's going to be very pro-Biden, and the one's going to be very racist, and make one, uh, I don't know. I would just... 
I just don't think it would have the writing of a John Hughes type. And I don't think there's a lot of writers that really... <laughs> you asked me another question, I'm gonna... I like Emilio's answer to Anthony. And got enough dirty bags. No, it's a uh, oregano. It's oregano. Yeah, they know. Yeah, they know. And it's weird that, you know, John Hughes, you know, after 1991, like, Curly Sue didn't do well. And he just said, you know what, I'm not going to direct anymore. Now, there's all sorts of things people mention as to why he really took the Curly Sue flop to heart. Or some say that he felt, you know, who's he going to write for? I might write, like, planes, trains, and automobiles. It doesn't you don't have to write youth oriented movies? Maybe it's like, hey, I wrote enough, I got I made enough money, I just gonna relax. Maybe that's you know, just some how so many people should retire. Maybe you felt, you know, it was my time and there's a part of you that man it'd be nice to have seen other movies. Like I still wish we had that movie he was going to do with Sylvester Stallone and John Candy called Bartholomew vs. Neff, N-E-F-F, where Bartholomew vs. Neff was going to be John Candy and Sly Stallone as neighbors that are fighting each other and feuding over various stuff. I think that would, I wish we could have seen it because I'm a big Stallone fan, love John Candy. I think, why was that not made? Instead, stop for my mind, will shoot got made. And now, I don't hate that movie like other people do. But, I'm sorry. Even though stop for my will shoot, I can watch and have fun. Just Stallone's having fun. It's goofy, it's silly, it's stupid. But, come on, John Candy and Stallone and... John Hughes directing? Come on, man. I think many people would love to have seen that. <laughs> now, there's two ways to think about why Judd Nelson's character is doing this. Number one, to keep the drug safe. But there's a part of me that wonders he's doing this to try to do at least one like selfless act. So he's not just a hardcore crappy asshole that just gets people into trouble. Nice slam dunk. And you look at his shoes, like even his shoes, there's like different colors. One's black and one's white. I think that's something I never noticed much And then the rolling of the ball. <laughs> and the idea of like actually jumping out of the out of the shoe. And then his shoe is gone. I wonder if you pay attention if his shoe is gone for the entire rest of the movie. Now, again, another another thing I've heard is that there was talks of a sequel that, say, maybe every ten years 
you'd have a film happen where they would reunite Now, I mean, that would have been interesting to see how that would work. Like, okay, every ten years, obviously ten years after this, that'd be like maybe 95, so they'd probably be, I mean, out of high school. Would they be in college? I, I just, like, wonder what the plot would be, just like, they just reunite ten years later. I mean, it would have been interesting to see how that came about. Uh, I'd be op I would have been open to it, but that just never came to be. I always thought this was a weird scene, I will admit. I I've always thought this was a weird scene with Paul Gleason like literally threatening John Nelson and I I, I guess a part of me kinda of always wondered what the point of the scene was. Maybe it was the show John Nelson's character in a you know, he's talked, he's all this and you know, he talks big, but he's, you know, just as scared as anybody else. But it is, for me, it just showcases more of just this principal is just a fucking psychopath. Ready to kill everybody in the school. That's not how I took of it. Like, in the sequel, this principal will be killing people. And it's up to the kids to stop them. That'd be a weird sequel. The breakfast, breakfast Club 2, Club Dead. Club Dread, Club Dead. I just... And then later on where the principal's like, well, you know, these kids betray me. And I didn't... The whole arc of the principal, I, I kind of flew over my head. Paul Gleason does a good job at acting, but it's like the principal just this came off as a psychopath to me. So So I'm listening. <laughs> I, yeah, I like the sparing use of music for these little moments like when he's crawling in the the crawl space the other bit with the when he's being truthful, and it, uh, also at the end too, where they're telling, they kind of telling their soul to the. <clears throat> yeah, that's the scene we never get away with either. You have a character, me you know, mesmerized by Molly Ringwald's Re panties. That would never be. Although I mean, I guess I think they are supposed to be underage. At least Molly Ringwald. I think she was probably like sixteen. So. Just didn't think of it that way. I guess it just a whole thing like you have a scene like that or you have people kissing but what one or two are underage and 
you know, what's the difference between that and like that Netflix film Cuties, and I'm not going to go on that whole conversation. That's up to other people to do. I'm just here to enjoy the movie. And they all don't get their weed on. Go down the road to Chichin Chong. Emilio disapproves. Because I know. My George is cocaine with Stephen Teen, and then we made Maximum Overdrive the year after. I love Maximum Overdrive. I still love that film tremendously. Sincerely. It's a dumb movie. Well, it's a very fun movie. It's a sincerely entertaining film. I take more movies of that nature than a lot of movies of today. There's a lot of movies that are really dumb and don't know that they're that, they're that fucking dumb. I think Ali, she's she's the only character that doesn't get high. I believe. Could be wrong. I just in a weird way, like, Anthony Michael Hall was sort of... Anthony Michael Hall and Molly Ringwald for John Hughes, like, Molly Ringwald was maybe his muse. And Anthony Michael Hall was kind of him projecting himself onto... The actor Anthony Michael Hall, like I'm gonna use this guy to portray maybe a versions of me throughout some of these movies. Now this voice Anthony Michael Hall does, you would hear repeated in weird, kind of weird science, where he's talking to the guy in the family jewels. <laughs> that one guy. In the family jewels. Yep, the one quote weirdo that says she drinks vodka and stuff is the one person that doesn't get high. Now, I've never smoked weed. I really haven't. I have haven't. People think I have, but I haven't. I don't know if this is what weird does weed do this though? Like make you hyper? I thought it did the opposite. <laughs> I somehow you smoked weed and now you look like you did speed. I didn't I never smoked weed, but I mean he looks like took speed or amphetamines, not weed. <laughs> But this is a pretty fun dance. And he does a stream that breaks all the glass. I think I remember reading that John Hughes regrets the breaking the glass stuff. <laughs> Maybe it's a little chuck while on me. I again, I guess if there's, I don't really have a lot of nitpicks with this film. I still find it very entertaining. I still find it funny. I still think the dialogue is on point. The stuff between the principal and the janitor, I would say never. The actors are good. That's why I'm not that bothered by it. I'm just saying that there's a bit that intrigues me the less is this, the conversation between these two. I'm glad they're very short and very brief, though. There's a part of me that wonders if you even needed that stuff with the principal. Like, him going in and talking to these kids, fine, but the dialogue between him and the principal, uh, the janitor, I don't even know if you needed that. Because what does it really amount to? It's not like Paul Gleason's character shows an arc. It's not like he 
ever apologizes to anyone or he changes his ways or he becomes a better person. Nothing really comes of it. Again, it's not like he has some revelation. Like, even the kids, they become closer friends and as at least someone to relate to and rely on. You know, as this says, five strangers, nothing in common except each other. They all have issues in their home life. I didn't pressure or the like. And their reflections of the bad seeds of their parents, the flaws of their parents. Never throw anything away. Neither do I. <laughs> Why do you fight Guy D? So I can vote. <laughs> I, that, I think that might have been one of the ad libs. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, obviously without the picture, like, what the hell are you saying, these random lines? I've seen this film quite a few. I remember having the VHS tape of this. And I don't know, it's weird. When I was growing up, for some reason, m simple movies I was attracted to. Not, uh, well, that's the wrong word. Well, in a way, like, I, it drew me t towards them. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just... Having a movie take place in one location makes me more intrigued to see how they work that out to make it interesting and make it unique. Maybe because as a kid, I didn't really get to go to much places because I lived in the middle of nowhere in Iowa, a different part of Iowa, and it really was the middle of nowhere. And the town, there were two towns nearby that had like a little grocery store, gas station some houses, maybe a school, maybe a factory, and that's it. That's um, same with the other town. And so, I don't know, just this isolated Porsche was in a way relatable. And... Or maybe just, what I mean that is like there's mall rats with Kevin Smith and there's even Dawn the Dead in the mall and, you know, this here, even like a Salt Breeze of 13, even Aliens to an extent takes place when they get there in one location. Just somehow it just intrigues me. I don't know what it is. Sorry, I'm I'm waiting for a certain line that really It's one of the sinking points of the movie. As in in sync, S Y N C. Not sinking as in it brings the film down, but to make the view in sync. But now you have characters sort of challenging each other, challenging their problems. I think it pops up in this scene. Might be another scene. 
Sorry, again, I'm just sort of watching the film. Yeah, I think it's here in this up close. What did they do to you? That's the line. And that's the question. What did they do to you? And that seems like be the question you ask to each of these kids and they would give you an answer that is one of the things they can relate on. And you go through each of these and it, I mean they say at the end as well but in the abusive nature of Judd Nelson's parents, the pressure to be the most beautiful person with Molly Ringwald's character to be the smartest and have the DNA no matter what but and there are people that have dealt with that pressure many upon many times I do. <clears throat> but yeah, it's one of those things where I, it's the success of 16 Candles where John Hughes was able to get this made and released. And like I said, nowadays, I don't know if this would even get released in the theater. But nowadays, ah, we have the scene here. This even goes on for a little while, but this is the, like the seminal scene of the movie. And there's still stuff afterward that shows a little bit of maybe Emilio and Allie, there's something. Between Molly and Judge, there's something. But this does become, this is sort of a therapy I guess in a way, way it becomes a therapy session where yeah, Ali Sheedy lying about stuff and the get Molly Remold to admit something. And in a way, I mean, it is, it's not risky because it's not going to cost that much money, but it is risky because if you don't do it right, many people would consider it very boring. I mean, if you don't cast it well, if you don't pace it well, if the dialogue is not either funny or natural sounding or well-meaning, it could just be a drag, a complete utter drag. And that's the thing, you get these distinct personalities, each one has a unique face, unique look, and perform their jobs well. And to this day, even people like Emilio that's gone on to do like the Mighty Ducks and Free Jack, well I like Free Jack, I'm alone in that, but the Mighty Ducks and Young Guns and other stuff, each of these people on screen, this is still a seminal part of their careers and it's probably one of the films that they're looked at the most whether it be Anthony Michael Hall or Judd Nelson or Molly Ringwald or so forth
I mean, some people say this is over dramatic and all that, but I don't think it is because I, I'm still bought into the acting. And again, like nowadays, there'd be a lot of like, oh, well, can we be outside of the school at times? Can there be a part where they go home for lunch, or can there be a point where they see and they visualize other stuff? Or can we you know, make it PG-13? Can we do, like, these other stuff that change things that made this work? Again, this is an interesting change of events where at first he says this and they laugh. And I say, okay, well, you butt she's taped together. But then, like, this is, I think, one of Emilio's best acting moments. Because he's calm and he's de detailing the story. And throughout this monologue, he's got to break down, be angry at his father, be regretful of his actions. And not seem hammy or over sentimental and be real in the moment. <clears throat> and like the way this is seemingly filmed is that he had a I don't know if I would say it was done all in one take, but I'm sure they were hopeful it would be done in one take. I mean, this camera looks like it's moving. It's not... I mean, there are cuts in it, but like this camera's been moving for a little bit. And again, this is one of the moments where you hear an actual piece of music. I like that the music is very subtle, very, it's subtle, it works for it, it's not, please be sad, it's, it's in there for that little emotional push, either that or this is the worst advertiser for Nike, just do it, just take someone's butt cheeks together and, You'll be regretful later. Just do it. Man, this is the worst Nike advertisement ever. I see the Nike on his on his shirt. Man, take this out. Get Michael Jordan back. Yeah, get him playing with Bud, Bud Bunny. It doesn't look like there's cuts in this. I mean, it passes over what the... It's supposed to be the heads, bodies of the other people. And in this finale, he is sort of the focus of it all. And his frustration and hatred of the dad is kind of another an in sync moment where everyone else relates to. So Judd Nelson, he's thinking of his dad. Ali Sheedy's feeling sorry for Emilio. And I think Michael Hall's character probably think of his dad. And he's going to unleash on his little thing. <laughs> and that's sort of a lie. They sort of cut the tension a bit.
at the end, it seems like a funny bit at first, like he's failing shot, but then again, it's this pressure of you have to be the best. For one is the jot, the other is the brain. Like you have to, you have to do this. And if you don't, then this sort of pressure from his parents. And so again, this sort of did get shop is like, you know, why do you think shop was easy? You know, it might not be fizz, it doesn't mean it's dumb. And, you know, Judd, again, given the moment of, you know, yeah, trigonometry is important, but shop is just as important to the build stuff as well. So one is not better than the other. <laughs> and then he gets this sort of seemingly harsh moment from Judd, but it's pretty much calling her out in the truthfulness where you're Miss Popular and you know the next day, next weekend, you know, next anything, you're not gonna say a word to anybody. That could very easily be the case. And then she calls him out well, what about you? Are you going to take this and this to, you know, take this guy out for drinks or take Effie Michael Hall's character out to do this? Sort of calling each other out on hypocrisy. And I've always said everybody's a hypocrite in some way. Just do you admit it and do you, or do you not admit it? And also how much there's different levels of hypocrisy. But I think everybody has some of it. Some lesser than others, but everybody has some of it. And for people to say I have zero hypocrisy, believe me, sooner or later you're going to be proven wrong. And then John Nelson, I guess, in his way, he's... I, the thing that the, is, it seems real. There would be someone calling her out, oh yeah, look at your earrings, like look how expensive they are. You know, you have to eat sushi, all that stuff. Nowadays, they'd be like, no, you can't hurt a woman's feelings. I'm like, no, they would. As long as they're not maybe, you know, Threat of beating cans on a fucking cell phone, they would call each other out. Is that like an after school special? Be bosom buddies and stuff. Sorry, I'm just getting into the film now. Listen to the dialogue.
And that's the thing. I mean, I obviously have not been to a school in a long time. I mean, I graduated from high school in 2004. So I don't know how the hell a school environment is nowadays if they still have cliques, if they still have like how it is nowadays. Is it rougher? Is it less rough? Is it more rough? Again, I don't know how it is in the world of today where now you have like the internet and chat rooms and texting and all that jazz. But yeah, if you did this type of film today, there'd be a lot of different varieties that would be put into it. And this is the day and age before that technology. No cell phones, no computers, no Facebook, Twitter, none of that. Yeah, sorry I haven't been saying anything, but, uh, I mean, each time I've seen the film, this is kind of what happens, where I just get... I just get hooked into it. I get hooked, because, again, the actors are on point. It's not overzealous. It's not over-dramatized. They don't have a consistent music to oversell the emotion. The camera work is simple as it needs to be. And also, I'm glad... Tyler camera work doesn't have a fucking tripod where the fucking... I mean, cameras do have tripods. So the camera's not just doing this. Because you know that's what will happen today. The camera will have to be doing this. And have to be doing... It'd be like this. And have to be doing this. And it's like, no, you don't need to do that. And now they're getting to the pressure they've got from others and their friends and other stuff about not understanding pressure. Oh, this is where you get the bit where he had a gun. Of course, nowadays, if you mention that he had a gun in your locker, it could be construed in a different way that he's. Columbine. Of course, here it's a suicide thing. And that's something that, I mean, sadly happens a lot. And you see the faces of the other kids is a very sobering reaction that someone in their this group had a thought process of suicide. Like you look at Judd Nelson's demeanor. You look at Judd Nelson's demeanor the whole time as kind of this 
this uh, sinking and then you gotta have a moment to just kind of with all this tension built up you gotta release it somehow that it went off in the locker And then the sort of thing is that she was just bored and she didn't need to be here anyway. Now think about that. That scene, that whole scene is 20 minutes long. The whole scene of just these kids talking to each other in the same spot, literally just having a 20 minute conversation with each other. That, with a bare minimum of camera placements, bare minimum of music, today that would be unheard of. Completely unheard of. This song I always thought was there. I wasn't. It works for the scene, I guess, but. I can't say I'm a big fan of the song. The scene works because of the actors and how energetic they are. And that after such a somber scene, you have the way they connect with each other. And this is, I mean, just classic. Anytime the, the people talk about 80s and you do montages, this is like a scene with all these kids dancing with each other. Definitely uh, symbolizing of unity in a weird way, them dancing together. <laughs> right back to trying to get through that damn... What, you know... Die, learn something from John McClane type of thing. <clears throat> but yeah, the... Think about that. I mean, 20 minute. We don't have a 20 minute scene where your five ter characters just talk. And they just talk. No action. No cuts to the outside. It'd be like, oh, can we put flashbacks? So, they flash to this scene here, we flash to this scene here, and do cutaways. No? Right in the scene. Oh, well, can we really play out the music? No? Very, very subtle, minimal use of music. It just would not be done much in today's age. Again, it'd be like, we gotta have something, we gotta have the camera moving a little bit, or shake a little bit. We, we gotta have something, it's like, no, this is the way it is. And that's why you had to challenge yourself with the script, with the actors. The acting to make sure it's on point. I think there's a lot of filmmakers and writers and directors and people today that they don't know how to fucking do it. They wouldn't be able to do a film like The Breakfast Club nowadays. They wouldn't know how to do it and do it well. Well, I don't think there's anyone that can make this type of film today. And make it genuinely effective. I just don't. That's not nostalgia talking. It's me looking at the world of movies and knowing this is the way it is. What the way the trends are, the fads are, all that stuff. And it makes the film work. This warm hat. This warm-hearted, coming-of-age comedy that helped define an entire generation. I can understand that. I don't know if the Criterion is still available. I mean, it'd be interesting to pick up one day, but I don't know. I mean, the 50 minutes of deleted scenes, it'd be like, well, I'd be just be curious to try to find a extended cut online somewhere. More of the bonding, Emilio and Allie, or Judd and 
Molly. And I did, in retrospect, I'm glad there wasn't a sequel. Because now we can think in our heads, in our minds, in our thought process on what happened. And you can make your own decision up. And honestly, sometimes that's just the best way to go. Because they could choose something that's just totally disappointing in every emblem of the slightest bits where like that that's what they went into that's what came up to think about it, every person who's a big fan who thought of a sequel to whatever property you like or film you like you don't think of a different type of sequel than your buddy or that person or that person or these 50 other people and so that means the sequel is always going to disappoint some people oh that's the direction they went in you want more of this you want less of that so sometimes, one movie is all you need. One movie is all you need. So again, what I said before, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what they would have done, but at the same time, I'm glad it didn't happen, because sometimes it's, it's, just, it's better to not press your luck. That's why, you know, I'm glad really none of those John Hughes films had sequels. There was no... Where there was a weird science TV show, to be fair, and like Ferris Bueller had a TV show that lasted for a bit. I was surprised there wasn't a Breakfast Club TV show. Each week in detention. Different kids, some of the same. I'm, I'm surprised. I think that is John Hughes in the car to be Anthony Michael Hall's dad. I think that is John Hughes himself in the red car. There's the infamous father. <laughs> and great song. It works very well with the movie. Definitely a good song. Dry way. Rain keeps falling, rain keeps falling down, down. Walk on by, rain keeps falling, rain keeps falling down, down, down. <coughs> And as we're getting to the principal reading the note, again, at the beginning, it was just one voice, but now they're all being united, and in a way made their own club, the Breakfast Club. And a great final shot coming up with the raise of the hand, the arm, that's just a classic pose. Good symbolism of the 80s. I mean, this is a classic pose coming up right here. <laughs> In a weird way, it symbolizes a certain sense of hope. Hope for the future. Hope to unite with people that maybe you didn't think you had anything in common, but you have more in common than you thought. And, again, just a weird sense of hope. Hope for the future. Uh, 
Uh, now we get into the really less good music in the soundtrack. Again, when people think of the soundtrack, the Breakfast Club, that's the only song they think of because the rest of the soundtrack is really not that great. <laughs> but yeah, the Breakfast Club, I know in the last in there, I, I kind of just went silent because I was just entranced with the dialogue again. Again, my only issues is the stuff with the principal and the janitor, I can honestly do a bit without. But the principal works well with the kids, like Paul Gleason does a good job, but like, the principal of the janitor having their little conversations, thankfully it's brief. But I don't know, just, to me, it didn't really culminate in anything. But yeah, the Breakfast Club. They said it'd be inter interesting to see the longer cut, see what all was cut out and not. And still holds up. Still holds up to this day, in my opinion. I don't think it needs a remake or any reboot or anything of that nature. I'm surprised they haven't. Unless they have, and I completely wiped down my brain. But yeah, Breakfast Club, to me, still a damn good film. Still one of John Hughes' best movies. Take a simple idea and get the right dialogue, the right cast, you make it work, and then some. So, with that said, thanks for watching. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.